which, believe it or not, is what most people think of when they think of relationships and networking. Um, but there's a lot more that came to fruition when I was thinking about this book, but that's the lesson I wanted to sink right here. Now, what happened to me is this mission of wanting to be President of the United States, wanting to change American manufacturing, it took a pivot, interestingly enough. And it was born from, there was no question, what was, what was born in this, in my gut, was scarcity and fear. We were poor. And I never wanted to feel that again. And, and fear, because I, and, and scarcity that I didn't think I would be able to. And I frankly felt broken. The, the abundance of going to a rich school and being a poor kid is so beautiful, but the, the negative side of that is I didn't feel like I deserved to be in the room. Now, I went to Yale. I ran for city council in New Haven. I, at the time, um, because I was Yaley, and my old man, who was a Democrat, said to me, if you're going to Yale, you're going to be a Republican. And I said, why, Pop? We've always been Democrats. He goes, because Republicans are rich. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So I went to Yale, which is not a Republican school. And I was the chairman of the political union of the Republican Party. And they, because I was, there's only two of us, um, <laughs> they asked me to run for city council in New Haven, Connecticut. So I did. Um, got picked up in the New York Times got national coverage, and people started calling me from back in Pennsylvania, wealthy individuals like Elsie Hillman and others, to say, come back when you're done with Yale. We want you to run. So I did. Left Yale, found a district that I thought I could win in Congress, and something happened that threw the curveball for me. I fell in love with a fraternity brother. <laughs> That was not a Republican way. <laughs> In fact, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a political way. It wasn't a way. Back in those days, Liberace was straight. <laughs> there was no role model. Anything that I, I told you I've never given this talk, not quite. Um, Anything that I hoped for myself, I saw no path to be my authentic self. The only time in my life that I've ever contemplated suicide was sitting uh, in, um, in my bedroom with my scrapbook of all the elections that I had won and the things that I had done politically and the, me working for George Bush Sr. when he was vice president and pictures of me in the White House at the podium pretending to give a talk as president and giving that up. <sighs> but I saw a pivot. I could maybe materialize my vision, save American manufacturing, but maybe I could be a businessman. Um, and maybe I could be authentic to myself, but just not tell anybody. Whereas I felt if I were to do that in politics, it would just be too difficult. So I went to Harvard Business School, but I had no money. Guess who funded my tuition to Harvard Business School? Mrs. Hillman and all of the people who were prepared to invest in my congressional election. The people that you robustly serve and then show up as an authentic, lovely human They'll always be there for you, no matter where your mission in life goes. It wasn't the same mission, but it was a new mission, and the people were on the journey with me. So I went to Harvard Business School, got out, and decided to go to a company called Deloitte, exercising all of the belief systems that I had learned in, and taught in this book. It hadn't been written yet, but this is what I was formatting. The CEO of Deloitte, stood in front of an audience of interns, which is what I was at the time, and said, someday Deloitte will be one of the top consultancies in the world at par with McKinsey and Accenture, at the time it was called Anderson Consulting. And I sat in the back of the room and I was like, hmm, we're the lowest of the big eight right now. <laughs> and I went up to him afterward and I said, sir, um, I'm committed 
to your mission. Remember this conversation, if you would. I'm going to come back to you in a few weeks. Well, I went and I did a research project. Um, remember, lead with generosity. I went and I called a professor in mine and I said, hey, let's do a project. What we're going to do is I'm going to study professional services marketing. And I'm going to interview the chief marketing officer of McKinsey, the chief marketing officer of Accenture. I'm going to interview all of them and I'm going to put together a playbook for how an organization become the top in professional services. And the professor said, great, let's do that. And I did it. And I told everybody, candidly, I said I was inspired by working at Deloitte, and, I'd love to, and, I'll, and, and I will give you the research. I was like playing a little mini Gartner group, right? I was like, I'll give you the research if you give me the information. But of course, who did I send it to? The CEO of Deloitte. Two weeks later, I got a, an invitation to come down to New York to sit with him. He's blown away. He said, nobody's ever stepped out of the way and did that. And your playbook is extraordinary. Um, I was an intern, remember? He goes, I want you to come into the firm. Back in my head, I'm like, frankly, I think I should go to McKinsey. Because <laughs> <laughs> I actually had an interview with McKinsey, and he somehow knew that, which was creepy, and said, um, do you think anybody at McKinsey knows who you are? I'm your CEO, and I want you to come. And I looked at Pat and I said, Pat, I'd love to under two conditions. Um, the first condition is that the, entire, the rest of the time that I'm here, you'll give me one dinner once a year, just you and me. And the second thing I asked for was more money. And he said, no. Um, <laughs> but he gave me the dinner. And he made me within a few years, the youngest partner ever elected in the firm and chief marketing officer of the company before I was 30, worldwide for Deloitte. Um, you find the individuals that are your path to opportunity and success, and you invest in them deeply and richly. And then you follow with authenticity. He became like a second father to me. I was closeted. I was in a beautiful relationship with a wonderful soul named Roel who in the workplace became my girlfriend, Renee. Um, and I, had to f I felt like I had to leave Deloitte. And Pat, God bless him, early on, I was sitting with him at dinner one time. I said, Pat, what would you do if you found out that there was a, there was a, a partner about to become partner, and, and you found out he was gay? Remember, this is in the mid-90s, something. He said, well, that's easy. Figure out a reason not to make him partner. That's not delight today. I was like, all right, good note to self. <laughs> well, I left Deloitte to go to Starwood Hotels with a young, ambitious, driven um, guy named Barry Sternlich running the company, who had a much more liberal point of view. Um, and in that exit, I went to Pat, and I said, Pat, he's been, he really was like a father to me. I said, Pat, I've got something I need to share with you. He goes, you're gay. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. How long have you known? He goes, I have known for a while. By the way, he never remembered the comment that he made. Um, he goes, I've known for a while. I figured you'd tell me when you're ready. Well, it gave me courage to be more, more, more of my authentic self in that process.